Chapter 11, Care of Patients with Immune and Lymphatic Disorders. Chapter Objectives. Clinical Objectives. When a threat to the body occurs, a competent immune system will stimulate certain physiologic responses, the vascular system release of white blood cells. These protect the body against invasions from microorganisms or toxins. In immune deficiency conditions, there is an insufficient production of antibodies, immune cells, or both. The disorders, disorders may be congenital or acquired. Autoimmune disorders involve the overreaction or the hypersensitivity to the antigens from the external environment that cause the immune system to be unable to tell the difference between self, which are the body's own cells, and the non-self, which are foreign cells. In primary immune deficiency disorders, the cause is an inherited genetic mutation, and some primary immune deficiency disorders may be detected during infancy or early childhood. Acquired immune deficiency disorder can result from medications like immunosuppressants that are used to prevent tissue or organ transplant rejection or chemotherapeutic agents to treat cancer that will temporarily reduce the ability of the bone marrow to produce white blood cells. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, is perhaps the most commonly known disorder that is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. The ideal balance of therapeutic immunosuppressive drugs would inhibit the normal immune system response, defend against invasion from assorted pathogenic agents, and control the occurrence of the usual side effects like stomach ulcers and tremors. Some of these treatments can lead to chronic medical conditions or iatrogenic, which is a side effect of a medical treatment, iatrogenic complications like diabetes mellitus, osteoporosis, and significant weight gain. Drug-induced immunosuppression, often referred to as therapeutically induced immunosuppression, requires a delicate balance between the control of the body's immune response and the side effects. Treatment in an immunocompromised patient is aimed at controlling the disease or eliminating the condition that led to an inadequately functioning immune system. Immune globulin Ig is a blood product that is given for the treatment of primary immunodeficiency diseases and other diseases where antibody levels are low or dysfunctional. Immune globulin is also used to remove harmful antibodies and to block damage from immune cells. There is still no cure, but there are now more than 40 different medications that have been approved by the FDA to treat HIV and AIDS. If patients who are HIV positive are compliant with their treatment, including routine testing to monitor overall health status and manage the effects of this chronic disease, the disease, this, the disease may be controlled and a good quality of life may be maintained. There are two forms of HIV infection. HIV-1 is the most common form in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Worldwide, 95% of the cases are HIV-1. HIV-2 is widespread in West Africa. 
Research has shown that HIV-2, it spreads at a lower rate, has a lower plasma viral load, and takes longer to incubate. And individuals with this strain have less risk of developing AIDS. Retrovirus differs from other viruses because of an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, this, which helps the virus replicate or reproduce and it places its gen genetic material in the deoxyribonucleic acid or the DNA of the host cell. The resulting new DNA continues the process of replication and produces as many as 2 billion viral cells a day. These are released into the circulatory system and it infects other cells in the body. An individual that is infected with HIV becomes more prone to opportunistic infections, including those derived from normal flora found within the body. Suppression or inhibition of the immune response as a result of HIV infection is the cause of AIDS. A CDC report in 2018 stated that more than 1.1 million people in the United States are living with HIV infection and that one in seven are unaware that they're even infected. The only mode of transmission is by exposure to HIV infected blood, body fluids, or tissue. Any break in the skin or mucous membrane is an entry portal for HIV. The highest risk factors for becoming infected with HIV are having unprotected sex, sharing needles and syringes with an infected, an HIV infected person, and maternal fetal exposure. Reducing the possibility of HIV infection with its resulting morbidity, mortality, and cost to individuals and society is the primary goal of pre-exposure prophylaxis. In 2012, the FDA approved the use of Truveda in combination with safer sex practices for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Daily oral pre-exposure prophylaxis has been shown to be safe and effective effective in reducing the risk of acquisition for HIV-1. Research has also found that post-exposure prophylaxis is more likely to be effective when the exposure is a single episode and the post-exposure <clears throat> post is less than 72 hours after the exposure. So the post-exposure prophylaxis is given within 72 hours after the exposure to HIV. Which statement regarding human immunodeficiency virus transmission is true? The answer is one, two, and four. The only way to prevent sexually transmission of HIV is through abstinence. Barrier protection must be practiced with every sexual encounter to prevent transmission of HIV or other infectious diseases. Latex condoms are more impermeable than other forms of condoms. Since 1985, all blood, blood products, and prospective organ donors have been screened for blood-borne pathogens such as hepatitis and HIV. HIV mutates rapidly and countless mutations have been found, making it difficult to develop an effective vaccine against HIV. Providing basic, understandable information helps dispel the myths and fears associated with HIV and AIDS and assessing for high-risk behaviors helps develop and implement individualized education. A person's pre-existing health status 
influences the length of time needed for the humoral and cellular immune responses to lodge a defense against HIV. Remember, the humoral immune response is antibody mediated and the cellular immune response is cell mediated. Multiple FDA approved home testing kits are available within the United States. These kits allow a person to anonymously perform the test and obtain the results in their own home. The choice of optimal therapy is based on clinical data and individual factors, such as past health status, medication history, patient expectations of therapy. CD4 lymphocyte count should be performed as part of the management. If the count is less than 350 cells per millimeter cubed, it is recommended that the patient initiates antiretroviral therapy and prophylaxis. The most effective and cur current treatment is antiretroviral therapy, which is a combination of available drugs recommended for HIV. This therapy is also effective against other conditions common to AIDS and HIV. Opportunistic infections are treated with drugs specific to their cause, and sometimes antimicrobials are given to prevent infection. In determining the optimal therapy for a patient infected with the human immunodeficiency virus, the physician considers which factor? The answer is one and three. There are various stages of HIV, just like there's stages of infection. So the first stage develops within two to four weeks. It's flu-like symptoms, and it's easily transmitted during this time. The second stage, the person is often um, has no symptoms. It can still be transmitted to others and if it is not treated, then it will probably advance to AIDS. The third stage is the terminal stage. The immune system is severely damaged and opportunistic infections and cancer can occur. Opportunistic infections are diseases that are caused by microorganisms that are commonly present in the environment or the body that cause disease only when there is a weakening or a suppression of the immune system. They are caused by many types of organisms, virus, bacteria, fungi, parasites, and protozoa. Opportunistic infections are often the hallmark of a transition from HIV to AIDS. Herpes type one are vesicles and ulcerations on the lips, oral membranes, and eye, and possible meningitis. Type two are genital and or perianal vesicles and ulcerations. The varicella zoster, which are vesicles along dermatomes or nerve tracts, these are shingles and they are noted to have itching and burning pain with low grade fever. Cytomegalovirus, which is retinitis, esophagitis, stomatitis, gastritis with diarrhea, cramps, anorexia, and weight loss. Hepatitis often has no symptoms. Patient can be jaundice, have dark urine, have abdominal pain, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, and joint pain. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This has respiratory and central nervous system effects. It affects bone, skin, GI tract, liver, and spleen. It will have a productive cough, fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Mycobacterium avium complex has respiratory and GI tract, and other systems may as well may as be may also be affected. This has a non-productive cough, fever, malaise, and fatigue. Cryptococcus is fungal meningitis, 
fever, headache, have seizures, motor dysfunctions, and altered mental status. Histoplasmosis presents with fever, pneumonia, limp adenopathy, weight loss, and central nervous system symptoms. Valley fever or cockadiomycosis is a pulmonary infection. It can have a fever, purulent sputum, and a rash. Candidus is thrush, esophagitis, or vaginitis. This would be yellow patches in the mouth, GI tract, and vaginal area. Pneumocystitis, formerly PCP, is a non-productive cough, shortness of breath, a fever, malaise, night sweats, fatigue, and weight loss. Toxoplasmosis produces flu-like symptoms and an inflammatory response. Cryptosporidiosis is gastroenteritis, dehydration, malnutrition, and debilitation. Carposi sarcoma is one of the most common causes of malignancy in HIV-positive people. Carposi sarcoma is caused by the human herpes virus type 8. It does not usually cause death. It appears as discolored areas on the skin, but can also form inside the mouth, lungs, and intestines. The skin discoloration may range from pink to red to purple. Lymphomas are tumors of the tissues and cells of the lymphatic system. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is the most common lymphoma in people with HIV and AIDS. Most of the non-Hodgkin lymphoma cases are aggressive forms that include large B-cell lymphoma, primary service ne central nervous system lymphoma, or Burkitt lymphoma. Cognitive disorders occur when HIV infection enters the central nervous system. Various names have been given to the alterations in the central nervous system that is produced by HIV. HIV encephalopathy, AIDS dementia, and AIDS dementia complex are all terms that are used to describe the changes in cognitive function characterized by dementia that occur with either HIV or AIDS. People ages 50 and older constitute about 45% of Americans diagnosed with HIV. Many older adults are not aware of the risks, but old age is no barrier to becoming infected with HIV. The primary trans mode of transmission in adults older than 50 are through heterosexual contact and sharing of contaminated needles among IV drug users. An older adult may ignore symptoms because of a belief that they are part of normal aging. All nurses should be alert to the possibility of transmission of HIV and the methods of prevention, and they should share this information with at-risk populations. Patients and their partners, families, and friends should all be included in the education. When a patient signs a form to release their medical information, the form must also state whether the patient wants their HIV or AIDS diagnosis and the treatment information released. If protected health information is relieved, released without following the HIPAA guidelines, a lawsuit and even loss of nurse, the nursing license may be the penalty for the nurse who is indiscreet and discloses the protected health information without patient authorization. Autoinflammatory diseases are the innate or natural immune system. It reacts without a reason and without control. This inflammatory process will produce a fever and many times it is a result of a genetic mutation. Autoinflammatory diseases are rare and include such conditions as familial Mediterranean fever. Autoimmune diseases are the adaptive or acquired immune system is responsible for identifying and eliminating foreign threats. 
In an autoimmune disease, the body does not identify its own tissues as self, but as a foreign threat. So the immune system is activated and it destroys the cells identified as a threat. Some autoimmune diseases are hereditary and others may be triggered by environmental factors or other illnesses. Autoimmune conditions are fairly common and significant research has been conducted to help identify the best treatments. Three categories of disorders are classified according to how extensively the disorder affects the tissues. A local is that which affects only a single organ or tissue. Systemic, this affects many organs or tissue. Mixed, localized, and systemic, this can cause problems in both a localized area as well as systemically. More than 100 diseases are thought to be triggered by an alteration in immune function. Some of the diseases have other causes in addition to immune system dysfunction. Autoinflammatory disorders are caused by a malfunction in the innate immune system and autoimmune disorders are caused by problems in the adaptive immune system. In autoinflammatory diseases, the innate or natural immune system reacts without a reason and without control. In autoimmune diseases, the adaptive or acquired immune system is responsible for identifying and eliminating the foreign threats. In autoimmune disease, the body does not recognize its own tissues as a self tissue. So therefore, the immune system is activated and it destroys the cells seen as a threat. Diagnosing autoimmune and autoinflammatory disorders can be difficult. A detailed health history and complete physical exam must be conducted. Symptoms may be vague and intermittent and may cover, occur over a period of years. The most commonly occurring conditions consistent with the presenting symptoms are ruled out first. It is usually after other diseases are ruled out that more in-depth genetics and testing is accomplished. The treatment for autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases falls into two categories. One is replacement or support of the lost or ineffective body function. Two, the therapies are targeted to halt the destructive process. The goal of physical, occupational, speech, or even psychological therapeutic interventions is to help the patient learn how to effectively deal with the disorder and be able to function at the highest achievable level for as long as potentially possible. Systemic lupus, also known as lupus, is an autoimmune disease. The term erythematosus refers to erythema, which is past patchy congestion of capillaries of the skin with blood. This often accompanies the disease. With mo most autoimmune disorders, the cause is largely unknown. Lupus appears to occur after puberty and peaks between ages of four, 15 to 40. Lupus occurs more often in women than in men. Lupus has a discoid form, which is where the skin is affected, but the internal organs are not. A systematic form, which involves internal organs, and this is the most common type, and a drug-induced form, which tends to be milder and less damaging to the body. Although lupus is incurable, the symptoms can be treated. Inflammation of the muscles, blood vessel abnormalities, and immune complex deposition in tissues occur throughout the body. Prolonged exposure to sunlight can initiate a flare-up of lupus. So the use of sunblock and covering the skin are important. A variety of drugs like oral contraceptives so, sulfa-based antimicrobials and penicillins, they will exacerbate lupus. In, in addition, hydrazoline 
and procainamide are known to produce a lupus-like syndrome. In lupus, all body systems may be affected. Weakness is considered a hallmark sign of lupus. To confirm lupus, a patient must have minimally four of the 11 clinical presentations or laboratory test results performed for lupus. Current research is focusing on identifying biomarkers that would indicate the presence of lupus. Hydroxychloroquine, an anti-malarial drug, aids in controlling lupus in the long term. Glucocorticoids, like prednisone, are taken to help reduce symptoms experienced during major flare-ups. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are used to reduce inflammation and control pain. Assessment by the nurse of the patient's ability to participate in activities of daily living is important. Joint, joint pain is common. Therefore, management of pain and assisting with mobility are priorities. Ongoing assessment of body systems is important to determine whether the disease process is affecting any additional systems. Lymphoma is a form of lymphatic cancer that starts in the lymphocytes. These cells become malignant and multiply crowding out the normal cells, which leads to the creation of solid tumors in the lymph nodes. The two main types of lymphoma are Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The primary difference between these two are the types of lymphocytes involved in the disease. Reed Sternberg cells are present, then the patient has Hodgkin's lymphoma. If Reed Sternberg cells are not present, the patient has non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's lymphoma is also known as Hodgkin's disease, and it is one of the more curable forms of cancer when diagnosed and treated early. The B cells in the immune system begin to develop atypical cells. The abnormal Reed Sternberg cells have two unique features. They rapidly replicate more defective B cells, and they do not die off as normal cells do. These Reed Sternberg cells replace normal cells in the nodes and in the lymph tissue. The disease spreads from one area to another via the lymphatic system and can invade other body systems. More than 80% of the cases present with lymph adenopathy, which is enlarged lymph nodes above the diaphragm. The patient may also complain of abdominal fullness, fatigue, profuse night sweats, unintentional weight loss, and pruritus. High suspicion for Hodgkin's lymphoma exists when the patient has complaints of swollen lymph nodes lasting for several weeks and no recent history of any type of an infection. Treatment for the lymphoma depends on the stage of the disease and whether the involvement is above or below the diaphragm or both. Once the stage is known, the absence or the presence of one or more of the following symptoms is noticed. Unintentional weight loss of more than 10% of body weight over the previous six months, an unexplained fever greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit for three days or longer, and profuse night sweats not related to weather conditions. In patients with four or more involved nodal areas who are older than 50 and who also have an, an ESR greater than 30, the outlook is favorable. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma tumors can occur in the brain, respiratory system, spleen, GI tract, bone, or other parts of the body. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is similar to Hodgkin's lymphoma, but it is less predictable and tends to spread to other body sites much more rapidly. 
There is also an abnormal proliferation of defective B cells or T cells in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Only biopsy of patholo pathologic lymph nodes and tum tumor tissue can provide a definitive diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There are five risk factors. It's, the tumors are widely spread or disseminated. There are elevated levels of lactate, lactate dehydro, dehydrogenase, poor functional ability of the patient, age older than 60, and disease spread beyond the lymph nodes. These are used to predict the outcome of patients with the more aggressive form of B cell lymphoma, which is the most common type. Having none or one of these risk factors suggests a good outcome, but having four or five will indicate a poor prognosis. When a relapse occur, they typically do so within the first two years after treatment. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma routinely manifests as a unilateral or one-sided, painless enlargement of a lymph node that may progress to generalized painless lymphadenopathy. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma tumors can occur in the brain, respiratory system, spleen, GI tract. The symptoms relate to other organs. The symptoms that relate to other organs are site specific and include, can include the complaints of high fevers, chills, drenching night sweats, unexplained weight loss, cough, dyspnea, chest pain, nausea and vomiting, a sense of fullness, and constipation. Hepatomegaly or splenomegaly occurs in about one-third of the patients. The nodes closer to the skin tend to be more easily palpated, are very paretic, and may be either red or purple. The effectiveness of the treatment depends on the stage of the tumor at the time of the diagnosis and the type of lymphoma. Staging considers the number and location of the affected nodes, whether the nodes are on one or both sides of the diaphragm, and whether the disease has spread to other tissues. Biopsy of various body tissues may also be performed in one of three ways to determine the type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It can do an excisional biopsy where the entire node is removed, can do a, an incisional biopsy where only a piece of the node is removed, or they can do a fine needle aspiration where a needle is used to aspirate tissue from the mass of cells. Treatment may be with chemotherapy or irradiation depending on the stage of disease stage one or two, or low-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma may be cured with radiation therapy alone. Surgery may be attempted if the tumor is localized or as palliative care. The lymphatic system drains waters, proteins, lipids, and waste from the interstitial spaces throughout the entire body and returns them to the lymph nodes where waste materials and foreign cells like bacteria are filtered out. There are two types of lymph at lymph edema. There is inherited and acquired. The inherited form, also known as primary, is a congenital condition where there is deficient growth of the lymphatic system, especially in the lower extremity. This con condition mainly affects women and most often becomes apparent during the middle teens to early 20s. The acquired form or secondary typically results from an obstruction caused by trauma to the lymph vessels and the nodes, such as during a mastectomy when lymph nodes are removed, after radiation therapy, or after a liposuction procedure where some of the lymph nodes may have been damaged. Other causes of obstruction include extensive soft tissue injury and scar formation. In tropical countries, parasites can often enter lymph channels and block them.
there is no cure for secondary lymphedema. The measures to manage lymphedema are lifelong and they vary with the symptoms. This is typically described as diffuse or multifocal pain with flare-ups and remissions along with migration from one area of the body to another. Although not a true form of arthritis, fibromyalgia interferes with a person's ability to perform activities of daily living and can cause significant fatigue and pain. Over the years, evidence-based research has supported the belief that this disease is caused more by an inappropriate neuro response to pain rather than inflammation. It appears that this disorder may also occur because of a deficiency in the neurotransmitters depend, dependent on serotonin and norepinephrine within the central nervous system. As fibromyalgia is better understood, more advances in diagnosis and treatment of this disease with or without drugs are being developed. Patients typically have either hyperalgesia, which is a heightened response to pain for painful stimuli, or allodynia, which is a pain response to non-painful stimuli. There is no specific diagnostic test that can confirm the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Therefore, treatment focuses more on symptom relief. Hypersensitivity reactions, also known as allergic reactions, are the body's response to a normally harmless substance. The severity of the condition can range from a mild rash to anaphylaxis, which is an extreme allergic reaction that can be life-threatening. Reaction will not occur until an individual's body has been sensitized to the specific substance that triggers the response. The first contact with the antigen or the allergen, the body's immune system is triggered to produce IgE antibodies to recognize the specific antigen. For second and further contacts with the allergen, the antibodies specific to the allergen, allergen are rapidly produced and released into the circulating blood or in the lymphoid tissues in larger and larger quantities. Because the numbers of antibodies is increased, they can be quickly transported to the location of the allergen, causing a more rapid and sometimes virulent allergic reaction. This type of reaction is typically seen within 15 to 30 minutes from exposure to the antigen and results from the increased production of mast cells and basophils from the IgE antibodies. During this reaction, histamine is released from a mast cell mediator. When histamine is released because of an immune response, it triggers increased mucus secretions, vascular permeability, and vasodilation, which leads to tissue edema. Dilated blood vessels transport the IgE antibodies, histamine, and other chemicals to the site of exposure to the allergen. Hypersensitivity is divided into four types. Type one is an immediate hypersensitivity reaction that involves immunoglobulin E, mast cells, and eosinophils. An example is anaphylaxis. Type two is an antibody-mediated reaction involving immunoglobulin E or G or M, attaching to cell surface antigens. The example would be drug-induced hemolytic anemia. Type 3 are immune complex mediated reactions. These involve bound antigen antibody complexes that's being deposited into tissues that cause inflammation and tissue destruction. Type 4 are T-cell mediated or delayed hypersensitivity reactions involving cell mediated immune reaction rather than antibodies. 
An example would be poison ivy dermatitis. Signs and symptoms for allergy and hypersensitivity depend on the agent of the allergy as, as well as how many mast cells and how much histamine is released in the body. The RAST test uses blood serum from the patient to determine whether the IgE to the suspected allergen is present. The major advantage to this type of allergy testing are that antihistamine medications can continue. The skin scratch test has been the most reliable method of allergy testing for more than 100 years. The skin is pricked by a needle and a drop of the suspected allergen is applied to the area. A needle is then used to slightly scratch the skin just below the epidermis. A patch test is similar to the scratch test, except that the allergen is placed on the surface of the skin and covered with an airtight dressing or a patch. For both tests, a negative reaction occurs when there is no erythema, edema, or complaint of itching. A positive reaction to either test is indicated by the appearance of a small wheel, usually dime size, at the site of contact with the allergen and possibly by complaints of itching. Anaphylaxis is a serious, life-threatening, whole-body allergic reaction. The cardiovascular system, respiratory system, GI system, and skin all contain copious amounts of mast cells. Any agent that causes a severe hypersensitivity reaction can cause anaphylaxis. IgE-mediated immune responses typically require repeated exposure for a reaction to occur. In the non-IgE allergen response, a single encounter may lead to anaphylaxis or even death if not recognized immediately. Allergies to seafood indicate an intolerance to iodine. This means that there is potential for an allergic reaction to iodine-based contrast agents used in radiologic imaging studies. The nurse should be certain that the shellfish or iodine allergy is noted on the home page of the medical record and in other locations where allergies are likely to be noted. Tachycardia, decreased pulses, and a rapid drop in blood pressure signal circulatory collapse, which can occur very rapidly. The patient will also exhibit increasing dyspnea because of the narrowing of the air passages, which is bronchoconstriction, an accumulation of mucus, and wheezing. If an airway is not maintained, convulsions may occur because of oxygen deprivation. Treatment must be started immediately to avoid hypoxic brain injury or death within a matter of minutes. Individuals that have extreme sensitivities to certain allergens should carry a medical alert card or wear an ID bracelet that contains the information. Many patients report allergies to medications that are actually manifestations of side effects, intolerance, or non-allergic adverse, adverse reactions. Nausea, constipation, diarrhea, coughing, or drowsiness may be side effects of medications, but reactions to drugs that do not involve the immune system are considered non-allergic adverse reactions.